Oh, sweet. First of all, Thank you so much for asking me to speak. And I mean, four months sober, I don't know, even know if I could completely introduce myself. So you just did amazing. I was just like, just your sincerity and honesty and openness. That was just what I needed in my heart tonight. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us. It was beautiful. Um, and thank you, Austri, for asking me to speak. It, it, I'm actually, she asked me a while ago and I kind of pushed it off. And I'm glad that I did because God had a plan. This was God's plan. At the last quarterly, um, oh, hi, Peter. Poor Peter. She could tell my story at this point. She's been <laughs> following me around. But um, uh, they're, they're getting ready to do um, a third edition, Our Stories Disclose, Our History in Western Washington. Um, and Dennis was there and they were like, Hey, if you get a second edition and buy the, you know, pre-sale for the next one, Dennis will sign your book for you, which he was the editor and he's my service sponsor. So I was like, how cute would that be? Well, then I started reading it because I think I'm like most people that like when I first read it, I wasn't in service. So you go to your district and you read that. And then you go to your group and read that. And then you throw it in the closet, never to be seen again. Um, and so this time I actually read it from cover to cover. <clears throat> and so I got to learn all about the Seattle group and group number one. There's a lot of great history in there. So I wouldn't have known about that if I would have spoke earlier. So it's a special <coughs> treat that you guys have um, uh, brought this meeting back and then I get to participate in it. So thank you very much. Um, you know, the, a vision for you talks about how normal folk drank. <laughs> that, and I was never me, you know? I started drinking at 11. <clears throat> I remember my first drunk, I had, uh, we sold some beers, we put them in water glasses and drank them with straws. I think we were trying to like get it into us as quickly as we could without tasting it because it was disgusting. Um, and I found a superpower. And the superpower was, that I was able to breathe. That knot that I carried around with me went away. I could take a deep breath and everything was okay. And it was the first time that I had felt that way. Um, and so I remember I went to my friend's house that night and the effects were wearing off and I, I wanted to reproduce that effect. So um, that first drunk I was, I drank, uh, I don't know if it was cooking sherry Something in the kitchen that had some alcohol that was like vinegar. I don't know what it was. It was disgusting, but I was looking for what had alcohol in it. Um, and that's, I mean, it was just instantaneous. How can I achieve that again? And what can, what can give that to me? And so my goal after that was to reproduce that effect as often as I could. Um, and because I was 11 um, and my, my parents, my mom and my stepdad weren't big drinkers and have a lot of alcohol in the house. I found that other substances could also achieve that effect. And so whatever it was, if someone said, do you want to try this? I wouldn't even ask what it was. Yes, I will. You know, um, and I, you know, continued on as often as I could, you know, and it, it went, I only say this, I, I try to stick to alcoholism, but you know, this is my story is it went to the extremes of, I would inhale gasoline because that would also, uh, produce the effect and which has a horrible aftertaste there's not enough gum you can chew in the world but whatever i needed to do to, to achieve that i did and you know things were all right you know it was because i wasn't able to do it all the time it was just when those opportunities would present themselves uh, but by the time i was 14 things were getting a little out of control you know i was um not really going to school. I was getting in trouble all the time. I think that's when I got my first minor in possession, had to go to, um, to a class, I did a deferred and I had to go to a class and I was high when I was at the class. So that wasn't super helpful. Um, I was getting kicked out of my house, you know, which I could tell when I got kicked out because my luggage, which would be black garbage bags were sitting outside. So I knew it was time to move on. Um, my mom was taking me my mom was single at that time, um, and so she was taking me to the state trying to get me in a group home. So things were like not working out great. So um, I went to an alcohol assessment and they said something and I didn't agree with it, but I was willing to go to treatment. 
And at that time, St. Pete's down in Olympia had an adolescent <laughs> ward. And so I said, I'll, I'll do that. You know, that seems like a good idea. Because I, I had now had a plan. I was really good with plans. I had lots of plans in my life. You know, most of them didn't work out. But the plan that I went into treatment with was I will stay sober until I'm 21 because that is when the state of Washington has decided you are mature enough to handle and control your drinking. Um, but this is the lie right away because I never tried to control my drinking. I always drank to get drunk. I And I was immediately a blackout drinker. So that's a curse and a blessing. I actually thought that was part of the drinking experience. I just thought everyone blacked out. I didn't know that that wasn't everyone's experience until... I actually was in the program a while before I realized that one. So, um, but you know, going to treatment, I'm going to stay sober until I'm 21. This is going to be great. And I was the best little treatment person you ever could be. You know, I was the first one doing my first step and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, when I got out of, uh, treatment, I did go to, my dad was uh, my biological father, um, had been in, in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for many years. And he got sober the year before I did because he saw, really, he was like, I need to get sober for her. Um, and um, so he took me to my very first meeting before I went to treatment and then took me to a meeting when I got after. And I went to live with him right after treatment. And he would take me to uh, these meetings. And I didn't do anything. <laughs> Just went to a meeting once in a while. And, um, you know, I invariably did some substance and I said, well, that doesn't count because it wasn't alcohol. And so I'll just not tell anyone. And then the second time I, I happened, I said, well, if it happens again, then I'll tell. I mean, you know, um, it's like I kept going and didn't tell anyone. And then the third time I just said, screw it. And I, um, and so now, I have, uh, so then I had a new plan. My new plan was, okay. Those other, other substances are really the problem, right? Like alcohol is a legal substance. I mean, it's not legal for me because I was under 21, but it's still a legal substance. Someone regulates it. So I will just stick to alcohol and all those other things um, I will not partake in. Um, so I did that for a little bit and wasn't really doing the trick. So then I added some prescription medication into it because that also is regulated. I mean, it wasn't my prescription, but someone, <laughs> you know, there's some legitimacy to it. And that really hit the spot. So that combination uh, was a good combination. And by then, I was drinking every day. Um, I wasn't I wasn't coming home. I, you know, I remember my mom, I came home one time and I was, you know, I mean, I was mean. I'm mean. I am a ruthless, mean, manipulative, mean person. I'm trying not to cuss because I'm being recorded. Um, and Austria will probably yell at me if I do. Um, and so I remember one time we were in an argument and she felt fearful. So she grabbed a bat to protect herself from me because that's how things had gotten to. She felt that that's what she needed to do. Um, you know, and um, I wouldn't come home for days. And I think, you know, and she'd be looking for me and I didn't give her the right number. I gave her the wrong address or whatever. Um, and I think about that being a mom now, like so harsh putting someone through that, you know, waiting for the phone to ring and who's it going to be the cops, the more that, you know, who's it going to be? Um, so, you know, once again, I'm getting kicked out and stuff, but now it's, now there's no more plans. You know, I've tried it all. I'm the designated driver. I don't have a driver's license, but people still let me drive. <laughs> um, but I didn't stay sober, but I still drove. You know, I'm switching friends. I'm moving. And, you know, I'm trying everything. Nothing's working. Um, and I know that there's that thing called the AA, but it didn't work. I mean, I didn't try it, you know, but still it didn't work. Um, I just could not imagine being that young and being sober for the rest of my life. What was I going to do on my 21st birthday? How was I going to, is your marriage really legitimate if you don't have champagne? Um, you know, I just had all these questions about, you know, my life for the rest of my life on Friday and Saturday night. What are you going to do? How do you listen to music sober? How do you dance sober? That's not going to happen. Um, and so, um, and I, most importantly, there was only, my dad was the only one left in my life at that time. And he was about ready to burn that bridge too. 
And I knew that um, I just didn't have anyone left and I was hurting the, my dad and uh, the people about me. And so um, I remember I got kicked out one more time. I bounced around a bunch of places. My dad was staying at this place. He locked me in a room because um, he didn't know what else to do with me. You know, I was going to bolt if he didn't. And um, I remember praying and it was the first time I prayed in a long time because I didn't really believe in God at that time. Um, you know, that's what we say to ourselves when we just don't want to look at the shit we're doing. But anyways, I remember praying and it was one of those really earnest prayers where your nails are digging into your, the back of your hands. You guys ever done one of those? Like you're so earnest about it, you know? And my prayer was, if you exist, kill me. Um, so at 16 years old, I, my, I was in the darkest place. It talks about it in Vision for You, the, you know, the loneliness and despair um, that no one but us kind of know. I mean, maybe other people know it, but that was me. You know, no more ideas, absolutely no hope, no solutions. Um, and um, I just wanted to, it, it would just be a bit better for everyone if I wasn't here anymore. And so um, my dad took me, my dad was sober at that time. It was Memorial weekend and he took me up to this cabin, um, which was like an, a bunch of AA people were there. And somehow I made it on this raft with this other girl, no life jackets, Nisqually River in May. Did you know May is the number one drowning? Did you know? <laughs> no one told me before I got on that raft that uh, May was the number one drowning. Uh, um, so we're on this raft and the or you know the current picks up and the oars get taken away from us and um the current takes us to this like log build up and the raft goes under and i go under the logs and i'm down there for a while and when i resurface i'm vomiting up you know water and stuff because i've been under for quite a while i'm in the middle of the nisqually river the water is you know hypothermic probably that's the big thing because you're getting the water from the mountains coming off um and i'm in the middle of the river and i got to make it across and we're miles from anyone like we're the nisqually it's like a, this actual forest did you know that like on the sides it's not, there's no like little trail you know little marker thing um and i just thought okay well this is it this is the time right i was just asking for this and i but i gotta make my way across you know and um, so I start going through, going across the river and I'm thinking, there's no way this is going to happen. I'm just going to get stuck right back where I was, you know, um, or, you know, further down, like th I, this is it. And I start going across and I, I felt warmth and the thought came to my head, who are you to kill yourself? If God wanted you dead, you would be dead. Like, I just was like convinced with the overpower, the, you know, the, how small I was in the scheme of things. And I had been given so many opportunities because I'd put myself in lots of dangerous situations, jumping off bridges and going with strangers. I survived all those things and I survived this. And I was given a moment of clarity. One, I didn't, I've never doubted the existence of a higher power since that day. And I was given enough clarity and willingness to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous and be completely willing to not just I'll do this. And I'll, Courtney talked about this uh, when she spoke at a gratitude banquet, like all the suggestions at the same time. <laughs> That's so novel. You know, like, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Like I would do, you know, all a cart, um, but you know, to go in and actually do it all at the same time um, and be completely willing. And so I did that. You're writing me a timer. Okay. Um, and I wish I could say, it, and then I like, you know, worked an amazing program, but I didn't, I was 16 years old and I came in with the same skill sets that I had come in, uh, you know, that I'd used out there. Um, so lots of manipulating and, you know, all that stuff. And I went into a hall, which thank God I did, cause they're much more tolerant of, um, Parkland hall, much more tolerant of us, you know, not well-behaved kids and, you know, mm -hmm. others. And um, they they just were patient with me. Um, and then at two years of sobriety, I kind of reached the jumping off place where I'm either going to do the deal or I'm going to go back again. And so I went to this old timer. The Parkland Hall really is, they're they a big, big thumping um, hall, really into the literature. 
And um, I asked this old timer if he would go through the, do the big book study with me. And he said, I will, as long as when we're done, that you pass it along to someone else. Now this big book study, we look up every word with more than two syllables in it. And it has to be a dictionary from the 1940s or whatever. So the dictionary is like this big. So it takes over a year to go through the first 164 pages. And then when that was done, I sat down with other people and then told them the same thing. And so that got me into the literature. Um, about the same time, I actually called my sponsor instead of just having a sponsor by name and started working the steps. And I, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of time, but I think the biggest thing for me, what was, you know, step two, I, I would stumbled on for a long time because I constantly was looking out here for my higher power. And I know it says it in the literature we seek inside, but I constantly was like, what's your God? What's your God? And stayed sober on your God for a long time because I couldn't connect with my God. I knew there was a higher power, but I didn't know. I didn't have all the answers. And it tells you, you don't have to have all the answers, but I like to know all the answers. I want to do it right or I'm not ready to move on. You know, that's very sticking for me. It's a theme. Um, so I would just say that, you know, um, as long as there's even a willingness to believe there's something bigger than you, then we're uh, good to go. Um, and so for my, my fifth step, the big thing that was revealing to me is um, that I put labels on people and like mom, for example, mom and dad, and then I have an expectation of what their behavior should be. And when they're not, I become resentful. I mean, I watch the Huxtables and family ties. Like I know how families are supposed to be, and that was not my family. And so I had huge resentments because it wasn't meeting my expectations. And what I found is that when I take that label off of someone, whether it's, you know, let's, I'll just say my mom, because that was the hardest relationship I had. And I just put her name Pat in. Then I could look at her as a human being, you know, just flaws and all, just trying to live this thing called life and breathe. You know, sometimes that's hard to do just on a daily basis. You know, get up. And um, so I was able to give her grace, you know, and and let that things go. Um, it's and I was able to apply that in all areas. It just really made the resentments that cropped up in my life. They're, I don't get very many of them because because of that tool that I was able to find in my step work. It's been a great reliever. That relationship with my mom though was difficult. You know, I um, my mom. Um, so my my mom got remarried when I was very young to my stepfather, and you know he did stuff to me that you shouldn't do. And my mom had a nervous breakdown at the time, and so while you know it's about the time I started drinking about eleven, yeah. um, and. So I had a lot of resentments there because um, she wasn't there for me and all the things that happened. And uh, I literally was so angry with her that if if we would have been in the same room when it was a six story building, I would throw myself out of the window so I didn't have to hear her voice. Like it was just nails on a chalkboard. I, I and what came out of my mouth was just horrible. Like I just couldn't stop myself. This is even after I was in sobriety. I just had so much anger and stuff. And while I was able to look at her as a person and flaws and everything like that, it just, I needed more time and more step work. And I just kept working on that with my sponsor and living life and experiences and stuff. And so I think I was about eight years sober. This is the miracle of the program for me. I spent 10 days in a motor home with her and I loved every second of it. We never got in any fights. It was just a miraculous, wonderful, I could not, I was not capable of that on my own. That was just through, you know, working the steps and working with my sponsor one day at a time, one foot in front of the other. And to me, it's like, those are the, those are the things that, that mean the most to me in sobriety. Yeah, I've danced sober. Don't, it's not pretty, but I do it. You know, I go, I have fun on Friday nights. I got married and, you know, we had that sparkling What's what's called, you know, sparkling marshmallows? Yeah, whatever, you know, and it was fun. It was the best party ever with a bunch of sober people. You know, um, I had my 21st birthday sober, and actually we went gambling, and I won 100 bucks, you know, um, and have lived a full life sober and got to experience all these things. You know, I've had the same career for 23 years. Um, I've been married for 23 years. 
um, which is a ch like that someone wants to live with me and be with me that long. We've been together 25 years and that's like insane. I can't even stand myself that much. I don't know. He <laughs> can stand me. You know, we've, we've never, we don't cuss at each other, which is crazy. Like, you know, when we first got together, that was like, I'm like, let's go. And he just turned around and walked away. And I'm like, it's really not fun to fight with someone when they're not there anymore. <laughs> so I had to learn new skills, you know, and, um, you know, all those things. And we've, um, you know, never kicked each other out and all that stuff. It's pretty miraculous to me. I think we've, in 25 years, we've probably been in about four real arguments, but still respectful, no cussing or hitting or anything like that, which is just insane for me. He's much more patient than I am. He does the silent scorn stuff, so he's not perfect. But, um, we, you know, together we worked on it, you know. Um, but it's those relationships, you know. My dad, I remember um, my dad was the only one who never gave up on me. He would say, she's going to be okay. And he showed me, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and stayed sober. And so when he was diagnosed with cancer... Sorry. It's been three years, but he was my best friend before Ken. And I moved in with him, and I got to be there and take care of him. And, be, you know, show him a little bit of what he did for me. And uh, it was an amazing time to live with him and be with him. And I'm super grateful for that. Um, you know, my mom's doing really well and, um, we have an amazing, I love this adult relationship with her and it's amazing. <clears throat> you know, I have a daughter who's 26 and Courtney and I just stopped by there and we were walking out and I said, gosh, she's a good egg. <laughs> and Courtney's like, yeah, she is, you know, and I, I take none of the credits from me. You guys taught me how to be a mom and I didn't know how to cook. I was 19 when I had her, you know, I didn't know how to, cook. I didn't even know how to be an adult, let alone take care of another human being. Um, and, you know, she's never seen me drink or drug. She's always been supportive of my program. She was raised and, you know, and not in the meetings, but around the fellowship. You know, I have these relationships that I've had in sobriety for 25 years. And, you know, those are my long-term friendships and stuff. Um, with that, though, comes heartache. I have a lot of friends who have decided to go back out and drink at different times. Mm -hmm. It's been a great learning lesson for me because they, they always talked about the yet when I came in because I was young. I didn't go through divorce yet or financial ruin or any of those things, but they talked about these yets. And then I stayed sober long enough to watch the same people that got sober when I did go back out and start creating that wreckages, the divorce mm -hmm. and CPS. And I knew I wasn't immune from that. That's what waited me. So the people that go out do give me lessons and it keeps me in here and it keeps me coming to meetings. Also, I had an old timer tell me, because I stopped going to, I wasn't going to very many meetings when I was about 13 years sober. And he came over to my house and he said, where would that leave the newcomer if y'all got sober and left? Mm -hmm. We were here when you got here. You need to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt a deep uh, sense of commitment to that. Um, you know, the hard <laughs> So COVID hit people hard and my sponsor was a casualty. You know, I, she had been my sponsor for 28 years and um, she knew me more than any other woman ever knew me. She knew, between her and my husband, they're the people that know me the best. And she made a decision to go back out drinking um, after 30 years of sobriety. And it, it, when she called me to tell me, actually I called her and she told me and, um, I physically felt that someone punched me in the stomach. I physically felt it. And I was a wreck. And the first thing I did when I got off that was I called a friend and said, will you sponsor me? And she said, of course. And I, so I was without a sponsor for like 30 seconds because I knew that's what I needed. And uh, I talked to my old sponsor and I pray. And I know if anyone knows, like I've seen people, as long as they're breathing, there is hope. And I pray. I've seen people that literally I thought they had wet brain when they came into the program because they could not put sentences together to the point that, you know, a few years later, they're like a career and kids. And it's like, how can this be the same person? I mean, you see these transformations. So I know it can happen, you know. Um, 
I, I have five minutes left. And so I wanted to talk about service because that's a big part of my um, sobriety. When I was about 13 years sober, and like I said, I was kind of getting back into meetings and stuff, but I was looking for women with longer term sobriety. And, um, you know, they're, we're from a hall. And so, you know, you have it from someone with one day to, you know, um, but I wasn't, there wasn't a lot of women because a lot of my friends had gone back out. And so I was kind of looking for that 13 to 20 year mark to build some relationships with, with some women. And I found them in service and someone, I was talking to someone and they're like, oh, there's this meeting. Um, you know, I don't even know how she got me there, but somehow I made it to the central service office in Pierce County and I became the newsletter editor. And that was my first service position. And I stayed involved in um, Pierce County service, central service office. Um, which is probably around the time we met. And, um, and then I just fell in love with service. I, I really started getting involved in the traditions. And what I found, gosh, I'm such a, you know, some quickly, some slowly, I guess I'm slowly. We had a lot of traditions in our home group. We had a weekly meeting and I would go to those and stuff and they weren't too bad. Um, and I did apply them in my home group and stuff. But, you know, it talks in the big book of 12 by 12 about, you know, that we need to gain greater humility um, and what I find is that the traditions are a practical application of humility for me. Like, I don't have to think about it. Is this humble? Is this not humble? Is my e Like, I just do, and I'm practicing it. You know, like, I can be a part of a group, and, you know, I can help a newcomer. I can be a part of a group conscience or go to a business meeting. Those are all think selfless things that I get to participate in. And so I don't have to overthink it. I just get to do it. So I fell in love with the traditions, got really involved in that. Um, and then, um, you know, got into more general service and now I'm involved in concepts and all different kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say though, when I asked Dennis to be my service sponsor, I remember the conversation we had, I was the central service office chair. So I hadn't been a GSR or anything yet. Um, and he said, what do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And I'm like, I don't know what, what do you mean? He's like, do you want to be delegate? Hell no, I don't want to be delegate. <laughs> are you crazy? Like, maybe I want to be like a district committee member. Like that sounds like fun. And maybe I could be a good one someday, but delegate. No, that's not for me. I'm not honestly in my head. I thought I'm not worthy. That's, you know, low self-confidence, big ego. Anyone really? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and so it's been a journey, you know, and I will tell you that it, it's people, you know, you know that you scare the shit out of people, right? Like, yeah, that's not a surprise. Um, you know, so she's always, you know, she's intimidated me and stuff like that. Um, uh, but she's always, she's always been supportive of me. Like, you know, she'll tell me some stuff that I need to hear, but it's always in a loving way. It's always, it's always sincere in a way to like help me grow and stuff. So I had people like her encouraging me and Steve and Dennis and all these people saying like, you're doing great. Just one foot in front of the other, you know, and, um, and that gave me enough belief in myself, but honestly it, it got to the point where it just seemed like the net next step. And I feel I'm fine with it. Like this is just another service position, you know, coffee maker delegates all the same, right? Like I'm mean, almost, you know, it's like you show up when you're supposed to, you be of service to others and you do the best job that you can. And then you rotate out and someone else does it. So I just try not to like, I'm not anyone. I'm just a drunk, just like you, who has the privilege of being sober, who gets to do really fun stuff, like go with Courtney and do a GSR school up in Everett today and, you know, excite people about this and come and talk here. And, you know, I do it, you know, you read it about Bernard Smith, you know, why do we have a conference and why did we do service? Because, and I'll, I'll say it a different way that I did today, we often look at the third tradition that uh, the only requirement for AA membership is the desire to stop drinking. We, we 